Welcome to this module of the Conservation Genomics course for Threatened Species Management. I'm Dr. Dayan Stanovich from the Difficult Bird Research Group at the Australian National University. And the work I'm presenting here is part of a collaboration with the Australian Capital Territory Government. And special thanks to Dr. Laura Rayner for making this work possible. I'm very interested typically in the outcomes from ecological research that can be applied by conservation and land managers. For most land managers who typically focus on really practical things like the number of animals that are born or die in a population or where animals occur in a landscape, genetics can seem like an abstract tool with limited applicability to the real world. Unless specifically trained, most ecologists and land managers fear the learning curve that they need to develop skills for implementing genetic studies. This means that these approaches are sometimes avoided despite their powerful benefits. This photo shows exactly what it looked like when two field ecologists had to sit in a lab and learn about genetics from scratch. But genetic tools can be used in the context of other ecological information to derive insights into population dynamics that would otherwise go unnoticed. Sometimes these hidden patterns can have really important practical implications for land and species management. This module considers the case study of superb parrots, which in collaboration with the ACT government, we have monitored in Canberra since 2015. The species is listed as vulnerable and they're threatened by a combination of land clearing and climate change. Their preferred woodlands have been extensively, extensively cleared for agriculture. And in recent years, intensification of cropping has further escalated the removal of scattered trees that support populations in already degraded habitats. Superb parrots nest in hollows of old trees and their preferred hollows are extremely rare in some woodlands. Thus, the species is limited at broad scales by the cover of woodland habitat within a region, but their ability to breed at a site is governed by the fine scale traits of tree hollows and the abundance of suitable nests. Superb parrots are also migratory, and GPS telemetry during some of our other step studies has revealed that they're capable of traversing hundreds of kilometres rapidly when moving between their winter and breeding grounds. Our population genetic study arose in the context of several years of ecological research. In one pre-existing study, we showed that only half of a percent of the available hollows in Canberra's woodlands are suitable as nesting sites for the superb parrot. Given the superb parrots only breed in two locations in Canberra, this extreme local limitation of nesting sites places a major constraint on their local population dynamics by creating a ceiling on the number of breeders each year. As part of another study, we showed that breeding within our population seemed relatively consistent within each year and that most nests were successful most years but observation of a handful of birds with leg rings suggests that there may be limited turnover among breeders. Reproductive skew is when only a fraction of individuals in a population monopolize the breeding output. In some of our other study species, like the critically endangered orange-bellied parrot, severe reproductive skews are a major problem that escalate in breeding. If this is happening to superb parrots as well, conservation managers in Canberra need to know as early as possible. Finally, the population size of Canberra's superb parrots was not known and could only be inferred based on the number of nests detected each year. Knowing the local population size was a high priority for managers because the breeding colonies of superb parrots are threatened by urban expansion and key measures of success of mitigation efforts include measures of population size change. Here, we use population genetic approaches to address three key aims that we hoped might enrich our knowledge of the ecology and demography of Canberra superb parrots. First, we aim to use genetic techniques to estimate the population size of superb parrots in the study area. Next, we aim to reconstruct a pedigree of the wild population to investigate relationships among birds born at different nests over successive years. Finally, we aim to evaluate evidence for reproductive skew in Canberra's superb parrots and to identify the ecological factors that might explain individual fitness. During routine monitoring of superb parrots each year, we visited all the nests in the population and handled the nestlings as part of ongoing data collection for health monitoring. As part of that process, we collected either blood or a feather. 
Although we didn't collect DNA from adults because they weren't captured, we sampled them indirectly via their offspring. We sent genetic material to DART in Canberra for de novo sequencing of SNPs. Using the linkage disequilibrium method and our own data on the life history of superb parrots gathered through the previous ecological studies on the species, we estimated the effective population size in Canberra to be 68. When we translated this to the census population size, we reached an estimate of about 75 superb par parrot adults in Canberra. This estimate broadly agreed with the results of the pedigree, which estimated the number of adult superb parrots in Canberra at 68 individuals. The pedigree also revealed important insights into the breeding system of superb parrots. We found that the two sub subpopulations within Canberra did not interbreed over the course of the study. And in fact, pairs that obtained a nest hollow tended to stay at that hollow. We could assign all of the parrots born into the population to only 34 breeding pairs. And these pairs were monogamous for up to four years. We found no evidence of divorce, and we also found that none of the juveniles born into the population went on to recruit there as breeders later in the study. Using the pedigree, we found evidence of strong reproductive skews that favoured superb parrot pairs that could secure multi-year access to their preferred nesting hollows. Of 34 breeding pairs, only 13 bred more than once, and it's not known what happened to one-time breeders after their first attempt or why they lost access to their nest hollows. Repeat breeders were responsible for producing the majority of offspring born into the population. Only 40% of the superb parrots born in Canberra were the progeny of one-time breeders versus 60% for repeat breeders. Interestingly, a fraction of repeat breeders contributed to a disproportionate number of the total progeny. Only five pairs bred three or more times, and they contributed nearly a third of the entire productivity of Canberra's superb parrots over five years. Overall, repeat breeders produced at least double the number of progeny of one-time breeders, meaning that overall, most breeding of superb parrots in Canberra was attributable to just a handful of pairs. The relationship between securing long-term monopoly over a nest hollow and individual reproductive success was very important among superb parrots. Most repeat breeders nested in the same hollow multiple times over the five-year study. We only observed hollow switching among repeat breeders on five occasions. We don't know why they switched nests, but there was no difference in the characteristics of the nest that they used. This study has multiple practical implications for land managers. Firstly, the study was able to show that the breeding population size of Canberra's superb parrots is surprisingly small. Apart from providing a baseline against which future evaluations of management interventions can be made, this result enables priority protection of known breeding colonies to prevent population decline. Second, the results reveal that previous research on the availability of hollows has important consequences for the population dynamics of superb parrots. Hollow availability sets a ceiling on the number of pairs that can breed in a given year, and the most successful breeders are those that monopolise access to suitable nests over several years. This multi-year occupancy of available nest hollows means that there are limited vacancies that arise for new breeders, and it's possible that this limits the natal breeding site recruitment of superb parrots in Canberra. This could explain why we observe no juvenile recruitment, but there are other potential explanations, such as high juvenile morta mortality, which we can't yet rule out. Our study also shows that there's high turnover among one-time breeders. Even though there was, on average, good reproductive success across all nesting attempts, most pairs only bred once, and their nests were usurped by other one-time breeders. This points to a major competition among superb parrots for limited nest hollows in the study area. Finally, the reproductive skew we identified points to a possibility of diminishing gene diversity in this population if limited breeding opportunities are not corrected. Given the reproductive skew we found is less extreme than for other more threatened parrots, Loss of genetic diversity in the Canberra superb parrot population may still be corrected by maximising breeding opportunities, by protecting hollow bearing trees and creating new nesting opportunities. 
From a practitioner's perspective, genetic studies can reveal processes that are otherwise unobservable. Although they require some specialist knowledge for interpretation, these days it's possible for practitioners to implement most steps in basic population genetic analyses using cheap, easily accessible resources like DART sequencing, and those with a knowledge of statistical analysis have access to major online tutorials and sources of code that can assist in the implementation of population genetic analyses as well as their interpretation. Collaboration with experts is still important in population genetic studies, particularly when it comes to interpretation, and also if there's unusual circumstances in the genetic data. But even so, practitioners have more opportunities than ever before to incorporate genetic studies into their project planning objectives. Importantly, genetic samples can be easily incorporated into most wildlife monitoring programs that involve handling animals. By collecting a feather, blood drop, or a tissue sample when animals are already in the hand, Practitioners can easily generate large new data sets that can be easily linked to other information on phenotype that are typically routinely collected in wildlife studies. By linking these different data sources, new insights like the association between hollow availability and reproductive skew in superb parrots can reveal important new information about population dynamics. These insights can then result in important practical outcomes for managers. In the case of superb parrots, identifying reproductive skews means that we can focus on protecting known nest trees, as well as improving the carrying capacity of known nesting habitat. These kinds of practical outcomes have arisen from just the first pass of population genetics in superb parrots, and it's an excellent example of how bridging the gap between the lab bench and the bush can result in really useful results. This is a case study in module 10. And thanks very much to all the TSI contributors.